The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. The house at the end of the dirt road, where disembodied voices whisper and strange sounds make the living shiver. Where shadows lurk at the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. And mysterious lights speed beyond reason across the clear night sky. Odd events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is Where Our Minds Wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. Thank you for joining us. Yes, welcome everyone. We hope you all had a nice Memorial Day. Yeah, we did. We had a long weekend, which we enjoyed. And we uh, went to the local history museum and to the War of 1812 Museum, which was nice. We hadn't been there in a while. So it was a good thing to do for a Memorial Day weekend, I think. Yeah. We had an awesome weekend. Yeah. And uh, we did decide to skip this week's housekeeping, although I know you have some thank yous that you want to mention. Yes, we did decide to skip this week's housekeeping. But we would like to thank all of you that have purchased items from our Tea Public store. We really appreciate that. It helps go to our cost of our equipment and, like we've said before, our subscription costs to our host. And also, I'd like to say thank you to all of you that have subscribed to our YouTube channel. It's awesome to see our channel growing because we haven't had it out there that long. It is very cool. It's it's growing every day, which is very exciting. So, Beth, ladies first, why don't you get us started and tell all our listeners where your mind wandered for this episode? All right. I mean, I always go first, but... <laughs> Thank you for making it sound all chivalrous, like, ladies first. Well, that's what it's all about. Well, that's true. You are very chivalrous. You do hold doors open for me and stuff. It's very sweet. I appreciate it. All right, I'm going to start now. Go ahead. Graduation ceremonies have always been a big deal. Caps and gowns, the reading of names, and the handing out of diplomas and degrees usually takes hours, especially when you add in the many speeches. Over the last month or so, you may have even attended a few. Congratulations if you did. But more than likely, the ones you attended didn't involve anyone being tapped on the head by a medieval space bonnet belonging to a guy buried in a parking lot. But at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, that's exactly what happens at every graduation. The University of Edinburgh was founded in 1582, making it one of Scotland's four ancient universities. St. Andrews, which I'll talk about later, was founded in 1413. The other two, in case you were wondering, are the University of Glasgow, which began in 1451, and the University of Aberdeen, which opened in 1495. If you think about that for a second, three of them existed before Shakespeare. That blows my mind that some of these universities have been around that long. It's just amazing. I know, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. Anyway, the University of Edinburgh is the sixth oldest university in continuous operation in the English-speaking world. It also helped Edinburgh earn the nickname the Athens of the North. In the last 150 years, the medieval space bonnet has tapped the heads of 100,000 graduates leading some people to believe that the tradition is what gave J.K. Rowling the idea of the sorting hat in her Harry Potter novels. So what exactly is the medieval space hat or the medieval space bonnet? It's kind of a long but interesting story. First, let me start off by 
attempting to describe what the hat looks like. With a name like Medieval Space Hat, you'd probably imagine something that looks pretty spacey. I'd expect it to involve some sort of metal, or at least something that looks like it could survive a trip to the moon. The reality is the Medieval Space Hat is more medieval in style than outer space fashion. So let's start with the medieval part of the hat's name. It's actually a Geneva cap, one of those poofy things made out of dark velvet or silk. The brim is basically a narrow circle that barely sticks out past a man's forehead. Other versions have no brim at all, but stay on a man's head because of a wide band of colorful brocade trim. But in both versions, the rest of the hat looks pretty much the same. A bunch of fabric gathered into a pincushion-like shape. It kind of resembles a kind of floppy mushroom cap, but it's made out of velvet or silk. Picture pretty much any character at a Renaissance fair or any portrait of a wealthy man from the 1500s, and you've definitely seen a Geneva cap. The legend surrounding the hat is that the material it's made from actually came from John Knox's pants. Now, for anyone on this side of the pond, you might be wondering, who's John Knox? John Knox was born in Haddington, East Lothian, in 1514. East Lothian is in the lowlands of Scotland. It's believed that he actually attended St. Andrew's University before becoming a notary priest. That's someone who wrote official documents. Meanwhile, Mary of Guise was the Queen Regent, meaning she was in charge until her daughter came of age to rule. Mary was so powerful in political circles that even King Henry VIII considered marrying her. He reportedly said that he was a big person in need of a big wife. Mary responded with, quote, I may be a big woman, but I have a very little neck. End quote. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't believe he even said that to her. That he was in need of a big woman? Yeah. <laughs> I doubt he said it directly to her. It was probably a lot of letter writing involved. But, yeah. Either way, even if you wrote in a letter, I wouldn't want to face her after that. <laughs> well, needless to say, she didn't marry Henry VIII. But, anyway, back to John Knox. So he positioned himself as Mary's bitter enemy, since she was Catholic and he was not. When he got himself mixed up in the murder of Cardinal David Beaton in 1546, he was sent to France as a punishment. When he was released three years later, he was exiled to England. During his time in England, Knox worked for the Church of England eventually becoming King Edward VI's royal chaplain. When Mary I ended up on the throne and re-established Catholicism, Knox was forced to leave England. He went to Geneva next, where he met John Calvin. Knox quickly became a believer in Reformation and Presbyterianism. He returned to Scotland and began Scotland's Reformation, which basically was a revolution that ended when Mary was ousted from the throne. Since she was a suspect in her husband's death, Knox demanded her execution. That didn't happen. But Mary died of dropsy, which was the medieval word for edema, on June 11, 1560. So John Knox is pretty much credited with Scotland's Reformation, And apparently, somehow, a pair of his pants were cut up and sewn into the Geneva cap at the University of Edinburgh. So someone out there is wearing his butt cheeks on their head. His britches, yes. (laughs) Well, I imagine the material came from the butt part of them. 
Why would you imagine that? It's pants. <laughs> yeah. Be cool if they had a little zipper. <laughs> I don't think they had zippers. They didn't. <laughs> no. I'm just saying. <laughs> so St. Andrews also claims to have his pants at their graduation ceremonies, by the way. And they're whacked by one of his pant legs at St. Andrews when they graduate. So that's one of the legends behind the medieval part of the medieval space hat. Why in the hell are they whacking with pants legs? Or tapping them on the head with a hat made out of the guy's pants? Yeah. Because, I don't know, <laughs> they just do. It's been a tradition for 150 years. Alrighty then. So, some records say that the hat was made out of someone else's pants entirely. A man by the name of George Buchanan. George Buchanan was one of Knox's peers. A humanist and a man of letters, Buchanan spoke out against corruption and supported Knox's reformation. So they could be an old medieval dude's pants, but they could be George Buchanan's, not John Knox's. Now, I had mentioned at the beginning of my story that John Knox is buried in a parking lot. You would think with a man with such history that he'd have a, you know, a much more prominent gravesite. Well, it wasn't a parking lot at the time. No, but now it's parking space 23, <laughs> to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's easy to find. You don't have to walk all over the cemetery looking for a gravestone. Right. You just go out into the parking lot and look for spot 23. Right. Yeah. So the truth behind that is, is that Knox requested that he be laid to rest within 20 feet of St. Giles Cathedral. And he was. But then when parts of the graveyard were tarmacked over and turned into a parking lot, the exact location of his grave site became lost. And there's a plaque set into the tarmac of space 23. And yes, cars do park on it and in it. Oh, no. It's a part. It's a working parking lot. I know. Well, they don't think he's really there in that spot. It's the general area of where he was buried. He's under the parking lot somewhere. Basically. Why didn't they just exhume him, move him? I don't know. I don't know when the parking lot was put in. I tried to find that out, but I could not come up with a date. I'm assuming the 1970s, maybe, or the 60s. I don't know. So was the medieval space bonnet or hat really made from the fabric of John Knox's pants? Maybe not. Well, more than likely, they're not, or it's it's not. First, John Knox died in 1572, which was 12 years before the University of Edinburgh was started. And that might not mean anything. I mean, somebody could have put his clothing away somewhere and then they got a hold of it. But sometime in 1999, although some sources say it was the year 2000, the medieval space bonnet was looking a little rough. In fact, the fabric was starting to split. Although it had been a tradition to tap graduates on the head with the hat for 150 years, officials were afraid that year that tapping it on the 4,000 more heads during that year's graduation would cause irreparable damage. So the university decided to have it restored. According to heraldscotland.com, Northwest Museums a firm from Lancashire, offered to do it. They hired Ede and Ravencroft tailors, London's oldest tailors, to do the actual work. And what they found was pretty interesting. As they worked diligently on the hat, they came across paper fragments inside the inner lining that bore the words, quote, Henry Banks, 22 Duke Street, Edinburgh, 31st July, 1849, end quote. Intrigued, 
they looked at census records and were able to determine that Henry Banks was such a successful tailor that he had six employees in 1851. The fabric of the hat also dated to the mid 19th century. So, either the hat was made in the 1800s and doesn't contain any fabric from John Knox's pants, or Initially, it really did at one time, but was restored by Henry Banks in 1849. Either way, it's highly unlikely that any of John Knox's breeches are part of the medieval space bonnet anymore. According to Atlas Obscura, the former principal of the University of Edinburgh, Timothy O'Shea, admitted that after being used at graduations for 150 years, it was unlikely to still have any original fabric from the 1500s still in it. So, that's the medieval part, but what about the space part of the nickname? That part of the story just happens to be pretty interesting, too. Piers Sellers was a British-American meteorologist and NASA astronaut. He flew three space shuttle missions, logging over 559 hours in space and 41 hours in spacewalks. In 2006, Sellers, who was an alumni of the University of Edinburgh, asked Timothy O'Shea for permission to bring the medieval bonnet into space during the Atlantis mission. Sellers had a small collection of things he wanted to bring up into space, and he thought it'd be cool to bring the hat. His collection included a piece of wood from Sir Isaac Newton's apple tree and an original watercolor portrait of the Cranbrook School, painted by Brenda Barrett. The Cranbrook School was Queen Elizabeth's former grammar school as well as another of the schools that Sellers attended when he was younger. Initially, Timothy O'Shea was totally up for it, but university higher-ups told him it would be, quote, an act of extraordinary madness to take the sacred bonnet into space, end quote. That's ridiculous. (laughs) Nothing's going to happen to it. Well, they thought it would be madness. (laughs) So, as a compromise, Sellers was given a velvet patch that featured the University of Edinburgh crest that he brought up into space with him instead. And when he returned to Earth, the patch was sewn onto the medieval bonnet, which now had the further nickname, the medieval space bonnet. According to Atlas Obscura, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the medieval space bonnet was brought to Edinburgh Castle. Since graduation was being held there that year for health reasons, the bonnet was taken out and used in the Great Hall. For graduates who were huge Harry Potter fans, the moment really did feel like the sorting hat scenes in the Harry Potter novels. For 150 years, it's been a tradition to be tapped on the head by this Geneva cap. And whether it's really made from John Knox's pants or if it's really been to outer space isn't really the point. The point is, it's a tradition. And who doesn't like some tradition on a day when you're performing a rite of passage? It makes the day more memorable, and it gives everyone something to look forward to as they sit through all those speeches. It is quite interesting. (laughs) I mean, I could see somebody in a pub, you know, 15, 20 years after graduating, and they meet other alumni, and they're like, hey, did you get tapped on the head with the the medieval space bonnet? Yeah, yeah, me too. And they'd, like, bond over that. You don't want to be the one person that's like, no, they didn't do it that year. You know? Yeah, I see your point. Yeah. It's tradition. Right. And we'll be back right after this quick break. (music) 
Hey, did you know? You can find all kinds of cool things in the jungle. In early May of this year, three mushroom harvesters were in the Dong Yai Wildlife Sanctuary in Thailand near the Cambodian border, searching for some tasty fungi, when they stumbled across something remarkable. A stone carving of a woman with long hair, dressed in a traditional long skirt and neckwear. Some experts wonder if she's been there since the 6th century, while others speculate she isn't that old. Either way, the carving on the face of a slanted boulder hadn't been seen for a very, very long time. Who'd have thunk it? All right, we're back. Yes, we are. Are you ready for your half of the episode? That I am. Oh. I'm raring to go. Good. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. All right, go ahead. I'm I'm all Twitter over here. I think you're going to like this one. Of course I am. It's about a pig. Oh. Somewhat. Okay. A naughty pig. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Knowing a little bit about the War of 1812 and how the major countries involved, the U.S., Canada, and England might see it differently, I was conscious of that when I was researching this story as well. Surprisingly, the sources that I looked at from all three countries pretty much had the same take on it. Lyman Cutler was fed up on June 15, 1859. Once again, his neighbor had let his pigs out to roam wherever they pleased, and like many times before, There was one in his garden once again, tearing up his vegetables. Tired of losing his produce and his neighbor's constant and blatant disregard for his property line, Cutler aimed his gun and shot the trespassing pig. Before long, Charles Griffin, the pig's owner, was told about the pig's demise. He confronted Cutler, who said that he was in the right. After all, the pig had trespassed on his property numerous times, and was eating his potatoes. Griffin allegedly replied, Rubbish! It's up to you to keep your potatoes out of my pig. (laughs) That's pretty good logic, I guess. (laughs) I guess. Little did that poor innocent pig know, but it had just sparked the pig war, a conflict that could have cost thousands of lives. As the two men argued, Griffin demanded retribution, of course. Cutler offered $10, which is about $340 in today's money. Griffin laughed at the offer and demanded 10 times that amount, or he'd have Cutler arrested. Pretty soon, the townsfolk, on both sides of the argument, were gearing up for an all-out military war, complete with armed troops and warships. Also known as the pig episode, and the pig and potato war, the argument over the hungry pig was the last straw in a conflict that had been brewing for a while. Because, you see, Cutler was an American and Griffin was British, and they lived on San Juan Island. The San Juan Islands, an archipelago in the Pacific Northwest, sit between Washington State and Vancouver Island, British Columbia. They are actually 172 separate islands, the four biggest being San Juan, Orcas, Shaw, and Lopez. Spanish explorer Francisco de Eliza named them in 1791. In 1792, both Spanish and British explorers came to the area. Border disputes between the United States and Britain became an issue in the 1800s and ownership of the San Juan Islands became a hot topic for debate, since the U.S. owned territory so close to Vancouver. Legislators thought that the problem was solved in 1846 with the signing of the Oregon Treaty, which stated that the border between the two countries was the 49th parallel. Part of the treaty designated Vancouver Island as British, even though it was below the 49th parallel, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the San Juan Islands in the Salish Sea were accessible by two different straits, and since neither was specifically named in the treaty, no one really knew where the border was. One strait, the Rosario Strait, 
was used by the British and the other, the Hario Strait, was used by the Americans. So both countries claimed the islands as rightfully theirs. For the most part, the settlers on San Juan Island got along pretty well, mostly because the majority of them were employees of England's Hudson Bay Company, and they had been there since 1845. They set up a salmon curing station there in 1851. But San Juan Island, which is about 55 square miles in size, sits at the mouth of the channels, and seeing its strategic worth, the U.S. drew up the Washington Treaty in 1853, stating that the San Juan Island actually belonged to the U.S. Understandably miffed by this, the Hudson Bay Company set up the Bellevue Sheep Farm. The sheep farm did very well, expanding its flock from around 1,400 sheep to 4,500 sheep by 1859. Meanwhile, the Americans wanted to use the island for themselves. I mean, after all, it had fantastic soil and the sheep were doing really well. By 1853, when the sheep farm was first established, between 14 and 30 American settlers arrived there. By 1859, 18 more American settlers had staked their claim on the land that was actually part of the Bellevue farm. The Hudson's Bay Company viewed this as illegal squatting. But since both countries felt that they had rights to the land, there wasn't really anything that anyone could do about it. Basically, some badly written documents had set the island up for failure, with both sides claiming it was their own. Now, I have to point out that the San Juan Islands had already been inhabited for thousands of years by the Strait Coast Salish, a group of indigenous people who most likely used the islands on a seasonal basis. After 90% of their people were taken out by the smallpox epidemic brought there by the Spanish in the 1700s, the small population that was left were now dealing with foreign countries arguing over their land, and then Griffin's pig wandered onto Cutler's farm. Charles Griffin, who was British, was an employee of the Hudson's Bay Company, and he was known for letting his pigs wander freely across the island. Cutler was an American farmer who may or may not have technically been squatting on the Hudson's Bay Company's land. So, as I said before, Griffin demanded a $100 payment for his dead pig, and if Cutler didn't pay up, he was going to have him arrested. So, that's about $3,400 in today's money. That's an expensive pig. That it is. So Griffin went ahead and reported Cutler to the British authorities, according to HistoricUK.com, and demanded that all the American squatters be expelled from the island. The Americans, remember, there were only about 40 of them at the time, wrote a petition to the U.S. military requesting protection. It was received by Brigadier General William S. Harney, who was the commander of the Union Army Department of Oregon. He reacted by sending the U.S. 9th Infantry to San Juan. The 64-man infantry arrived on July 27, 1859, captained by George Pickett. Now, if that name sounds familiar to all of you, it's because Pickett's charge during the Battle of Gettysburg is named after him. When... Pickett arrived on San Juan, he came with a proclamation. He said, This being United States territory, no laws other than those of the United States, nor courts, except such are held by virtue of said laws, will be recognized or allowed on this island. According to the BBC.com, when the governor of British Columbia, James Douglas, heard about the American infantry's arrival, he ordered three warships to be docked off the coast of San Juan Island. The 31-gun steam frigate, the HMS Tribune, arrived along with the HMS Satellite and the HMS Plumper. The Satellite was a Pearl-class 21-gun cruising warship, and the Plumper was an 8-gun sloop. So they had some firepower there. All because of a pig. All because of a pig. It's a lot of guns over one pig. The American soldiers were encamped just north of the sheep farm. 
They surrounded their camp with 14 cannons. They brought in eight additional guns from the USS Massachusetts to add to their arsenal. And Pickett brought in even more men, raising his army to a total of 461 men. Out in the water, the three British warships played chicken with the Americans, performing daily drills with their 52 guns, shooting off rounds into the bluffs. According to the National Park Service website, the officers involved on both sides weren't necessarily taking the standoff all that seriously. They were attending church services together aboard the satellite and drinking together in Charles Griffin's house. That's interesting. <laughs> so they're they're all aiming their guns at each other, but the officers are out drinking together in the pig owner's house. Right. Wow. And yet, the fact was, there was a massive military force inundating this island. With their three warships, 84 guns, and over 2,600 men ready for a major fight. But you got to figure, they were making friends there. Right. You know, they had to be. Yeah. They were drinking together. Right. Luckily for everyone... Admiral Robert L. Baines, the commander-in-chief of the British Navy's Pacific Fleet, arrived. American officers Pickett and Casey were granted a parley with Admiral Baines. But Baines refused to even meet with them because they had arrived by lighthouse tender, and he didn't want to get off his own ship, the HMS Ganges. Apparently, when Pickett saw the 84-gun Ganges and the two additional warships that had now joined the cause, he knew for certain that his own troops were sorely outnumbered. However, despite not even meeting with Pickett and Casey, Baines refused to engage with the American troops, even though Governor Douglas had ordered him to. Baines famously said that he was unwilling to involve two great nations in a war over a squabble about a pig. Believe it or not, Neither Washington, D.C. nor London military officials had heard anything about the escalating tensions on San Juan. But I guess that makes sense since it escalated so quickly and it was 1859. Right. News would not have traveled particularly fast, I guess. Right. But when President Buchanan did hear about it, he dispatched emissaries immediately to put an end to the ridiculous pig war. One of the emissaries, General Winfield Scott, was instrumental in reaching an agreement with Admiral Baines that was then approved by Governor Douglas. Here's what they worked out. Both countries would share the island for 12 years, by which time true ownership would be declared. Both countries could have a maximum of 100 men living on the island at any given time and the British men were to live exclusively on the north end, while the Americans stuck to the southern end. Then in 1872, after the Civil War ended and the focus could be put back on the San Juan Islands, both countries agreed that an impartial third party should hammer out the final territorial decision. Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany stepped in, and after a year-long deliberation, held in Geneva, Switzerland, he gave his verdict. The San Juan Islands officially belong to the United States. And just like that, well, over a decade later, the pig war had ended. So, was it really a war? Not really. And thankfully so. There wasn't a single human casualty during the conflict. And the pig war really can't be blamed on just a pig but it probably can be blamed on the wolves who tried to blow his house down. That was a really good way to put it, actually. That was very clever. It wasn't bad. It was pretty good. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> but it could have all been avoided if the dude would have just kept his pig on his own property. Right. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it sounds like any little thing would have set them off because they had been at each other's... They'd been at odds with each other, the British and the Americans, for a while. Any little thing probably would have started it. Right. But it happened to be the pig. Right. It could have been just, you know, somebody gave somebody a look at the 
at the bar, you know? Well, not that they had bars, but you know what I mean. Well, I would have done. I would have just made some pork chops with it and some bacon. Right. You would have eaten it. Some of it. And I would have put some away, but then I would have sent some over to... Griffin? Yeah. <laughs> you would have sent him some some ribs and been like, oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Then I would have went knocking on his door after and said, hey, remember that pig, you know, the, the bacon and the pork chops I sent over to you? Well, that was your pig. And it tasted so good because it's been fattening up on my potatoes and carrots and other things in my garden. Right. That's what I would have said. And maybe they would have just let it slide. No, yeah, maybe. You never know. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode, Beth. <laughs> You're done just like that? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know me. I could go on and on when I start. Right. Right. Well, let Nobody me... Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> let me get in my, uh, my plug for our sources. As I always say, if you want to know more, check our sources in our show notes. They're a great starting off point for how we put the episode together. But there's always a lot more there that we don't include. And if you're interested, you can learn a lot more. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode, Beth. Yes, it does. Join us again next week for all new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. See you soon. See you soon.